Welcome back live to SoFi Stadium in Eaglewood, California. Time for the press box. I'm Larry. She's Mary. We're here to talk about the Cowboys and Chargers. And Mary, just seconds ago during the break, the Chargers and the Cowboys got into it on the sideline behind us. There was some sort of big scuffle going on. And that sets the tone right off the bat of what we're going to expect from this game. It's going to be chippy. I don't know what caused it, but both of these teams are in need of bounce back wins or just bounce backs for their season right now. Absolutely. So our first topic right now, let's talk about the Cowboys offense. Who is the blame for the Cowboys inconsistency? Usually it starts with the quarterback, in this case, Dak Prescott. What do you say about that? Well, Dak just hasn't been making the plays that he needs to be making, and a large part of that is because he hasn't had time. So if you can, if you don't have time against a defense like the Chargers, then I don't know what to tell you if you're the Cowboys. <laughs> they aren't great with their pass defense. They don't blitz the quarterback often. So this is the time for the Cowboys offense to find their stride. It's a good matchup for that. Yeah, um, unfortunately, when you're a member of the Dallas Cowboys, especially the quarterback, it's going to start there. And Dak does have to shoulder a lot of that blame. But I also think it has to do a lot with the play calling. He's still trying to get used to Mike McCarthy and Brian Schottenheimer when he had Kellen Moore all those years. So I think it's kind of a, a two-headed monster right there. And once they get that worked out, things will certainly be better. So, Mary, last night on Instant Replay, we asked viewers what the Cowboys have to do differently to win. Now, your options were CD, throw it to him more. Cooks, throw it to him more. Tony Pollard gave him the ball so he could run more. Or the boys play better defense. And the viewers said 43% throw it to CD. 37% came in second. Uh, defense came in second with 37%. What do you think? This is a time for complimentary football to come into play. Uh, last, last time out, the offense struggled because the defense, you know, or the defense struggled because the offense wasn't doing a whole lot. Dallas fans have called on C.D. Lamb to be in the mix more and to be to be utilized more. There's a lot of offensive weapons that the Cowboys have that haven't been utilized. So, yes, I completely agree with the viewers. Getting C.D. Lamb in the mix, especially against the, the Chargers' unfortunate pass, pass rush so far this year, pass defense, uh, C.D. Lamb's going to be key in that. One thing I would love to see the Cowboys do more, and I've said this before, I would love them to utilize Tony Pollard more as a receiver receiver out of the backfield. We know how he can rush the ball, but that guy can hit a home run every single time, and he's equally, if not more, dangerous coming out of the backfield catching a pass, so I really wish they would utilize him there, so he sure does. Yeah, so third topic, uh, Austin Eckler, the Chargers' awesome running back, is back. He's going to play tonight. What does that mean for the Chargers and the Cowboys who have to face him? Yeah, he's a 28-year-old all-purpose running back. He is incredible productive for the Chargers so it's going to be big for them this will also be a time for the Cowboys defense to kind of get get in it get in it more get up front more and, and stop the run they've struggled with that in the past in past games so um, Eckler will pose some challenges for the Cowboys defense but it's it's uh it's going to be a good matchup and Eckler being back is is pretty big for the Chargers all right how important finally how important is it for the Cowboys to win this game going into their bye week it couldn't be more important. The Cowboys have some tough matchups coming up. The Rams, the Eagles, you know, this is a time uh, to really kind of switch up the narrative a little bit and say, hey, maybe uh, maybe let's not use that overrated word as much as uh, it's been used this past couple weeks. You know what? Cowboys absolutely need this win. They don't want to go into the bye week at three and three. They want to go into the bye week in four and two. That is always a better feeling. So, Billy, I don't know if you can see, uh, if you can kind of help us out here. The uh, Chargers are on this end zone behind us, warming up, getting ready for this. Uh, former Steel High School great JT Woods is a part of the uh, L.A. Chargers. And you know what? I told Mary this last night. It's still tough for me to say L.A. Chargers. Growing up in SoCal, they were the San Diego Chargers. So to say L.A. is just so weird for me to say. It's probably a little more natural for you, I suppose. I mean, I guess I have less years that I've called them the San Diego Chargers if you want to say that. But yeah, times are changing. Hey, it's it's there's a lot of football going on in L.A. right now, but uh, I think the viewers at home know that it's probably going to be about 70, 70 third or in favor of Cowboys oh, fans yeah, here. Cowboys yeah, home game for sure. I mean, yeah. look at all these Cowboys colors around me. So, hey, if that pregame scuffle was any indication of what's going down tonight, we are in for a good one. So that does it here for us at SoFi Stadium. We 
We will have your highlights and post game coming up on the night beat. Let's send it back to Steve Spreester in the studio. Steve. Mary. Larry. Sportscast. That's not ordinary. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Migrant shelters reached all-time highs across Texas recently. How a state on the opposite side of the country is handling this crisis. Next. Massachusetts Governor Maura Healey says her state's emergency family shelter system overwhelmed and nearing capacity. The governor explains an influx of migrants being bussed and flown into Massachusetts stretching their resources thin. Well, now officials are being forced to put a cap on the system. Right now, the state estimates around 7,500 families being housed in Massachusetts migrant shelters. That comes out to about 24,000 total people. We do not have enough space, service providers, or funds to safely expand beyond 7,500 families. We expect to hit that limit at the end of the month. So starting November 1st, authorities will start prioritizing families with urgent needs like health and safety risks. Other families that don't qualify will be put on waiting lists. State officials say they'll also start helping families and more permanent housing options help them find more permanent housing options when they actually leave the migrant shelter system. The Department of Justice is opening a hate crime investigation after a six year old Muslim boy was killed and his mother injured in an attack investigators believe is tied to their faith. That child was laid to rest today and the 71 year old suspect was charged with murder and hate crimes. Melissa Adan reports on the FBI's report of increased crimes targeting the Jewish and Muslim communities as the war in Israel rages on. <laughs> Today, a funeral was held in Illinois for a six-year-old Palestinian American child who police allege was killed because of his religion. Investigators claim the boy was stabbed to death by his landlord, 71-year-old Joseph Zuba, who they also accuse of attacking and seriously injuring the boy's mother in their Plainfield, Illinois apartment. Authorities allege the landlord stabbed them because of their Muslim faith. The young boy reportedly stabbed 26 times. By the time she came out, he had located and murdered her child, six-year-old Wadia, by stabbing. This all happened in seconds. The Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE, a Muslim civil rights and advocacy group, condemned the brutal attacks. The Justice Department opening a hate crime investigation. And he paid the price for the atmosphere of hate and otherization and dehumanization that, frankly, I think we are seeing here in the United States. Since the Israel-Hamas war broke out, the FBI has been monitoring threats directly related to the conflict. This has divided protesters hold rallies across the U.S. supporting Israel and the Palestinians. From pro-Palestine rallies in Philadelphia to pro-Israel rallies like this one in New Jersey. When 9-11 happened, we all together protested together and we realized it was Islamic terror and Islamic terror needs to be uprooted and destroyed. <laughs> Today, supporters of Jewish Voice for Peace demanding President Biden call for a ceasefire in Gaza, asking to protect innocent Palestinians. The FBI and police across the country remain on high alert for potential violence driven by anti-Semitic or Islamophobic sentiments. Melissa Don, ABC News, Los Angeles. Here at home, look outside with live cam this evening. Pretty picture out there as the sun sets earlier and earlier. And these temperatures, you said it earlier, Adam, we've waited so long for this change. So how long is it going to stick around? Yeah, we deserve this. We have a few more days of this. Yes, we do enjoy it. And we've been running well below average, which is nice, especially in the mornings. That's going to be the case again tomorrow morning. 75 right now, but by 9 o'clock, we're down to 64. Midnight, we're down into the 50s, and then at 6 a.m., we're talking 47 degrees here in San Antonio. Even cooler in some outlying areas. We'll dive into that, how cool and where, and how much temperatures rebound later this week in just a bit. Here's your recap. A federal judge barring former President Donald Trump from publicly targeting court personnel, witnesses, and special counsel Jack Smith as his staff in his election subversion case. That gag order coming down just a few hours ago. Trump's legal team will likely appeal the motion, already saying it interferes with Trump's First Amendment rights 
and ability to campaign. San Antonio police investigating an overnight drive by shooting that sent a teenager to the hospital. This happened on Lincolnshire Drive just before midnight on the city's east side. Shots were fired at that teen from two dark colored vehicles, rather a few houses away. Right now, there was no word on the teenager's condition. Yeah, police are also trying to figure out what led to a man being shot in his leg overnight. They say he was shot in his knee about four this morning north of downtown. The man told police he was just walking down a street when he heard gunshots, then realized he was hit. He was taken to the hospital, expected to be okay, but police haven't released any information on a possible suspect. And that's your 60 second recap. Let's talk temperatures now. They've certainly fallen, but if you are an early riser, it's going to be chilly out there in the morning, Adam. I like the extra blanket idea. That was, yeah. that was, that was a good visual there, Adam. I had that from firsthand experience. Yeah, that's how I got that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's for so long it was just the sheet, the thinnest thing possible. Then at one point I was like, "Ooh, that breeze coming in. This is nice. Let's get that oh, come, pull that comforter back up." Anyway, temperatures will be warming up both for the mornings and the afternoons. Let's start with the afternoon temperature trend. 78 tomorrow, so very similar to today. Into the 80s Wednesday and Thursday. By this weekend, we're looking at high temperatures back into the lower 90s. And you look at October as a whole, at least thus far. And it's a pretty even split between above average and below average days. But overall, compared to average, the temperature is running about two degrees above average. But we're starting to starting to change that a little bit right now. This morning we were 50 officially here in San Antonio, but even cooler in many outlying areas. Then we topped out at 77. Notice both of those numbers, the low and the high, below average for a change. And you know I say that for a change because Hottest summer on record. Hottest month ever on record was August. September was the hottest September on record. We had such above average and record setting temperatures that it's nice to see this kind of a trend. This afternoon, we made it to the upper 70s for most of us. A few locations hitting 80. Hondo 80 for the high, Del Rio up to 83. Right now, we're at 75, a beautiful sunset. But keep in mind, as that sun's setting, that 75 is going to turn into the 60s very quickly and our north wind at 14 is going to simmer down, which is going to allow the temperatures to fall off quickly along with the cool air or the dry air. We'll have a calming wind, clear sky, and we have this very dry air. The north wind pushing in dew points down in the 30s and 40s, so that refreshing fall feel to the air and this isn't going to change much the rest of the week. We'll see a little spike in humidity, but you won't notice it much on Thursday. Then another push of north wind drops those dew points again. But I think by this time next week, you'll notice some mugginess back in the air. 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. Have the sweatshirt or light jacket. 43 Gonzalez, 45 in Hondo. Even Junction down into the upper 30s. Canyon Lake 45. In and around most of San Antonio, about 46, 47. You get downtown 49 for the low temperature. By noon, we're already up to 70 degrees. So this dry air allows us to cool off quickly, but also warm up very efficiently once that sun comes up. So 70 at noon, then 78 for the high temperature, and not much of a breeze probably three to six miles per hour and just shifting around a little bit. Tomorrow afternoon, Hondo 77, New Braunfels 78 for the high temperature. And notice the trend for those highs, as I mentioned before, going up a little bit back into the low 90s by Friday and Saturday, which is above average for this time of year. Mornings, however, will just get back up to near average in the lower 60s. 51 again Wednesday, but then we're back to 61 on Thursday. And then generally in the lower 60s through the weekend and even on into next week. And I do notice that I did mention there on the seven day that we will probably start to feel the humidity again by this time next week, late Sunday and even into Monday. This is the longest stretch of lack of mugginess we've had in many months. So we're going to enjoy it. Don't take it for granted is all <laughs> I'm saying. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Adam. Pumpkins in the buzz after the break. <laughs> To the buzz and a New Hampshire police officer taking the motto serve and protect to a whole new level. The officer pulled over a door dasher for speeding last week. Turned out the driver's license and registration of that door dasher were suspended. So that door dasher had to find a ride from a friend, but the officer wanted to help the driver complete their door dash order. 
so they just delivered it for her. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Ring the door, but you open the door though, yeah. and there's a police oh. officer. Yeah. Your order. A student at Harvard is ecstatic to have finally completed a lifelong dream. He rode across a river in a giant pumpkin. Benjamin Chang <laughs> crossed the Charles River in Massachusetts inside a 1,500 pound pumpkin. Yep, that's his dream. He got the giant gourd in New Hampshire and with the help of some friends, rolled it to the river in Cambridge early Saturday morning. The bioengineering student spent two hours carving it out before setting sail. Chang hopes the maiden voyage demonstrated the wonders of biology and inspires others to think outside the box. I don't know why they did it, but all I have to say is that's using your gourd. I'm surprised. I'm just going to ignore that. I'm surprised it's it, literally it took only two hours. Well, to hollow it out, yeah, I think it just take one of them. Just one of them. A pair of endangered Sumatran tiger cubs finally made their debut at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. Yeah, brother and sister Hutan and Puteri were born back in July as part of the zoo's wildlife conservation efforts to revive the critically endangered species. The cubs, the first newborns in the San Diego Zoo's tiger habitat in seven years. They seem to be fitting right in. Yeah. Yeah. All right, this is something you don't see at the polls here in the United States. This man brought his cat with him to the voting booth for Poland's parliamentary election. Mr. Kristoff says that voting is important. It's a, an important part of Polish society. He wanted to bring this cat to the polls because usually she's alone, but wanted her to be there for him for such an important moment in his life. You OK with that? Cats at the voting booth? I, I, if somebody goes to the voting booth and a cat's what gets them there, then sure. I think it's perfect. Okay. But we'll be right we'll back. See you after the game.